Well, hello, friends, and welcome to another Ask the Experts. Happy Friday. If it's Friday for you, I hope you've had a fantastic week. And if it's another day of the week, I hope that you're having a great day. We have a special guest joining us for our Ask the Experts edition today, Stephanie Mara Fox. And Stephanie is a somatic nutritional counselor. She has a master's degree in somatic psychotherapy. She also has a wealth of knowledge for those that struggle with disordered eating, emotional eating, binge eating, uh, chronic dieting, and so much more. She is a teacher at the Psychology of Eating Institute, where Stacy and I are graduates of. So it's really an honor to get to share and introduce her to you all today. She has supervised thousands of mind-body eating coaches all around the world. Woo, what a fascinating conversation we are in store for today. So just to kick things off, Stephanie, tell us what got you into this work. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that introduction and really super excited to be here with you all today. So, you know, we all teach what we need to learn. And so in my early 20s, I had really severe digestive issues, a lot of pain and uh, digestive diseases actually run in my family. So at the early age of 21, I ended up getting a colonoscopy and endoscopy done and they found nothing. And so uh, through that experience, it really launched me on a journey because the doctor just left me with, well, watch your triggers and manage your stress. And that was basically it at the time. There's a lot more research that has come out since then around what contributes to IBS. You know, this was a long time ago at this point. And so I... Uh, you know, it started me on this journey of diving into yoga and Ayurveda and mindfulness and mindfulness-based practices and ultimately ended up in me getting my master's degree in somatic psychotherapy. And I really just wanted to learn about this mind-body connection and what was affecting my gut, not just physically, but also emotionally because we have this enteric nervous system, this gut brain, and there were so many layers of healing that needed to occur that it wasn't really just about food, which I think a lot of the times, especially in the nutritional world, if we have a symptom, automatically it goes towards that food, like what's going on with your food. And that's the thing that the only thing that needs to change. Not necessarily. There are actually a lot of layers and it could be multifaceted of what needs to be addressed and attended to that isn't only about the what you're eating. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of uh, for almost over a decade now, I've been supporting other individuals in their relationship with their food and their body. And like you were talking about with emotional eating and binge eating and chronic dieting and over exercising and body image concerns and unexplained digestive issues. Because the thing is, is I get a a lot of individuals who come to me saying, I've tried everything. I've tried every diet. I've gone through every test and this digestive thing is not healing. And at that point, there's a lot of other kind of more emotional realms that can be explored. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, a very brief <laughs> introduction yeah. of uh, how I got into this work. Yeah. It's like the things that we go through, we, we can either grow through it or, you know, it's all in how we choose to like, do we extract the wisdom from this? And it sounds like that's what you did. Um, you turn that into fertilizer for your growth and to, you know, guide your destiny. And here you are today helping others on their journey in similar, but maybe slightly different situations to heal. Um, thanks yeah. for sharing and that we are exactly where we're meant to be. Mm. You no, know, it's such a process to heal from something. And I often find that, especially with this kind of go, go, go culture that we live in of like, you got to get to your healing place faster. And no one really gets a medal for like getting there as fast as possible. And that if we bypass trying to just speed through our healing journey, that there may be a lot of lessons to pick up along the way that mm -hmm. actually there was a, a huge amount of like grief and sadness and like all the emotions that were even stuck in my own body that weren't being attended to and addressed and processed through my own system, you know, that that needed space too. So I think that sometimes we get these 
picturesque images from movies and media of healing is such a fantastic, beautiful journey to embark on because we always, especially from social media, get the the end picture. I'm the healthiest I've ever been, the end picture. Right. But rarely do we ever see the really low points mm-hmm. and how long it took to get to that point. And the journey never really is done. Like, I still have days where I have a very sensitive digestive tract and I get to, I'm in deeper connection and relationship with my digestion that I can now interpret it, understand it, slow down and be with it Mm -hmm. instead of seeing it as like, oh, I'm back at square one. So I just wanted to also name that, that I think on any healing journey, sometimes we also have to kind of identify where we are on that path. And that sometimes we're kind of more in a dark place for a period of time. You know, I, I always like to use the imagery of that uh, when a caterpillar goes into its cocoon, it has to completely dissolve into mush to transform yeah. into a butterfly. Sometimes we're just in the darky, mushy place. <laughs> and that, that's like a really yeah. important place to be sometimes too, because something is transforming out of it. We just don't know what that's going to be yet. Yeah. Oh, I'm so love that you mentioned that about there's no like gold medal for getting to the end faster to like, it's okay to be where you are to slow down. And let's just pick up these. Let's hear what life might want us to to learn or maybe where life is calling us to like evolve into like that imagery you're sharing about the caterpillar and the, the mushy stage. Like, yeah, um, it's, it's a good reminder. So I, I wonder, like, when I'm thinking about a memory that I had back when I was seven years old, Stephanie, and this was, this is when I remember the lady next door, she used to lay out and tan. And that was when tab was popular back in the (laughs) seventies. I was like, I was clueless then about what diet soda was, but that was my first experience with it. And I thought, oh, she is just so sexy over there. I want to be like her. And then as a teenager, you know, the that's when 17 magazine was coming out and then the Cosmo magazine. And for a lot of the folks that I coach for them, it it was like influences such as Twiggy or maybe actresses like Catherine Hepburn. So I'm wondering, you know, where does someone who has spent their lifetime possibly being critical or struggling with their body image issues, wishing they could be different, comparing themselves to someone else, like where do they even start and how do they find this self-worth without all these cultural influences? Yeah. So this is going to sound really counterintuitive, but oftentimes the first thing that I like to explore is beginning to befriend that inner voice. And so a lot of the times what I find is that individuals have been fighting that voice. They've been trying to drown it out. They've been trying to tell it to go away with no success. It's still here. It's still with you. Because ultimately, that part of you got cultivated at a time of your life when you needed it. Maybe there was something that fell out of your control. Maybe you were being bullied at school. Maybe there were things happening in your home life that felt a little too overwhelming to navigate. And so to focus on your body image gives you a perceived sense of control. This is my body. I can do with it what I want. I can feed it when I want to feed it. I can feed it how much or how little I want to feed it. I can move it in any way that I want. So it gives this perceived sense of control in an environment that fell out of your control. So if we start to actually see that that part of you that's saying like, you just need to change your body is actually they're trying to support you in some way. It's Mm -hmm. even giving you information already that when that voice shows up, there's a part of you that maybe already feels unsafe because Mm -hmm. it got cultivated during a period of time where you didn't feel safe. So they came in to provide you with the experience of safety in your body. So it it sounds like, wait a second, you're telling me to actually befriend this part of me that's being so mean to me. And yeah, like if you think about a bully, Mm. a bully has learned to be a bully because that was the only way they learned how to get attention because even negative attention is still attention. Mm. So we all need to feel seen and heard and held, and we will do whatever we possibly can to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of saying, okay, 
I'm going to turn around. I'm actually going to face you and be like, you want my attention right now. Mm -hmm. And at first they might be really angry at you. You maybe haven't been listening to them for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of your life. Mm -hmm. And so they probably are a little hurt they're sad, they're angry. And so they are going to maybe be even louder at you at first. And something that you can start to explore is if this part of you had a job, this comes from a little bit of uh, internal family systems work, that if you're this part of you had a job to do in your life, what is their job in that moment? So it just starts to like shift it a little bit of, okay, this is just a part of me. This is not all of me. And this part of me is trying to do their job. If I just tell them to go away, I also tell them they're not allowed to do their job and then they get louder, but I have to do my job. You created me for a reason to do this job for you. So it can be, okay, so if right now this part of me is telling me I need to lose 10 pounds. Okay, so what is their job? All right, their job is to tell me I need to lose weight, but why? Okay, if I lose weight, then I might be more loved. I might be more accepted. I might feel more comfortable in my skin. So if we kind of start to sleuth a little bit underneath around why this part of you is telling you that you need to lose weight and kind of put the uh, surface level story of you need to lose weight to the side and say, oh, they're trying to make sure that I feel loved. Mm -hmm. Okay, how else? Could I support this part of me and myself feel loved in this moment that has nothing to do with my body shape and size? So then you get to step into curiosity. Curiosity brings choice. Choice is empowering. Telling yourself you need to lose weight is not empowering. So we need to kind of enter into a space of empowerment so that you get to move more into a relaxation response in your body, which is really important. That's where healing occurs is when we are in that relaxation response. So the other piece I want to name along with that is that a little piece around how I also work differently is that I don't believe that body love starts with loving your body. So I think that there's the, a lot of pressure to actually love our body as it is. And you don't actually really need to love your body to respect your body. Oh, that's powerful. Yeah. So it's first kind of, and if anybody has a pet, I have a, a Corgi mix dog that I love and you might hear him bark at the background at some point because <laughs> he hangs about. But, you know, it's like, okay, if I could think of this body as a pet, like if you have a, a, an animal in your home, if they are thirsty, if they are hungry, if they are cold, you will do literally anything for that pet to make sure that that pet is okay. Like I would do anything for my dog. So we kind of, in some very silly way, need to think of our body a little bit as our pet of just, you don't have to like it. Like some days my dog is super needy. <laughs> like I don't have to like that he's super needy that day, but I can still attend to his needs. So your body needs food every single day and water and clothing and warmth and all the things that it needs every day. You can just start there with saying, you know what? I'm going to take the pressure off of myself for today to actually love my body. And what does it just my body need today? How can I just respect that I have a body? I wouldn't be here without this body and kind of go from there. Over time, there may be more of an appreciation of your body and what it can do. You may even start to love little things about your body, but you don't have to love your body day in and day out. I mean, think about it like any other relationship you have in your life. You know, some days if you have a significant other, or even friends and family, you don't like love them every day. You might get into an argument with them. You might get not on the same page together with them. And then you work to get back on the same page through communication, through dialogue, through being committed to showing up in that relationship and not abandoning it. Mm -hmm. You think of the same thing with your body. You're not going to be on the same page with your body every single day. You're not going to like your body every single day. And just the commitment of I'm going to keep showing up in relationship with my body can also start to just shift that if you are having like what they call a bad body image day, instead mm -hmm. of 
kind of going into the story of all the things that are showing up. It's just, can I commit to showing up from my body the best I possibly can today to be in relationship with it so I don't self-abandon myself? And, you know, that just deepens your relationship with yourself without the added extra pressure of what that's supposed to look like. Yeah. Oh, Stephanie, there's so many pieces in that that I, I would love to dive into with you. Uh, like one, one thought is that, you know, how we choose to approach our weight, if you will, like if, if, okay, like we're in this body and we want to shape shift it, that instead of keep keeping on pounding the same way, the same dieting protocols, like what I'm hearing you share is this loving, more self-accepting, like you said, befriending your body and actually seeing what if there's a message in here? Like, it just seems like such a more healing approach. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a ton of research on how powerfully transformational self-empathy and self-compassion is. And that we cannot hate ourselves into healing. Mm -hmm. So if you, that, that is a first baby step. If you are hating on yourself, if you have a lot of harsh internal critical dialogues with yourself, that's actually the place to start. Mm -hmm. And that it's addressing, can I start to be in relationship with these parts of me and with myself in new ways so that the journey starts with self-understanding and self-empathy and self-compassion that you've always been doing the best you possibly can. Even thinking the part of you that has been maybe even a little bit harsh to you because they've been doing that because that's what they were taught. They were taught that, okay, you won't give me attention until I'm super mean to you. I mean, think yeah. about it. If you're nice to yourself, do you give yourself as much attention you're just like, oh, that was a really nice thing I just said to myself. Okay, on to do like a million other things I have to do. But if you're like, oh my gosh, you need to do better. You're not good enough. You don't look good enough today. You are in that dialogue, paying attention to yourself maybe for hours. So it's actually a really wise strategy from this part of you, from the habituation in your body of like, oh, this is how we get attention. And so it actually might feel really uncomfortable at first to say, I'm not going to give that story as much airtime. I'm going to hear maybe what's underneath and why that is showing up right now to support me in feeling safe and protected. And I always like to normalize like that you're stepping outside of your comfort zone. Th that feels that like sounds weird. Like, wait a second. So being nice to myself is me stepping outside of my comfort zone. And yes. Because our body will get accustomed to whatever way we feed it, whatever way we interact with it. And so at first, it's not actually going to feel good. So going back to that, like, oh, we only see the like end result in like movies and media of like, oh my gosh, look at like this amazing transformation I just had. And actually, there's a lot of discomfort that needs to be sat with along the way and do it in little tiny chunks and pieces. You know, there is a word called uh, titration that basically you don't want to overwhelm yourself with like, okay, I'm going to dive into everything all at once. That can feel really overwhelming that then you kind of like pull way, way, way back. Mm -hmm. So a healing journey has to be little tiny baby steps where it's even checking in with yourself and saying like, okay, so Stephanie is telling me to start to interact with this part of me different. Like, how do I feel today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I sleep well last night? Do I feel regulated? Do I feel calm? Did I have a fight with someone today? Do I actually feel like I am in a space where I could practice showing up for that part of me in a new way? Some days it's just like not possible with all of the other factors that maybe you're navigating and it's saying, it's okay. You know what? We didn't sleep well last night. To try something new today, that today wouldn't actually be the optimal timing to do that and making that all right. You know, we're, I think also just a little bit of some of the, I want to call it like toxic messaging, even in the wellness world is like to always be growing yes. and you don't always have to do that. <laughs> Sometimes you get to say today, I'm good enough right where I am. Mm -hmm. This spot right now is exactly where I need to be. And that actually, if I pushed myself to grow today and did something outside of my comfort zone, 
that would feel so uncomfortable that actually I might disconnect and disembody for a couple of days, even a couple of weeks, because I pushed myself way outside my comfort zone. And now my body needs space to know it's safe. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this journey, and this is where I'm a somatic practitioner. So what that basically means is, you know, mind body connection, I take more of a body oriented approach, instead of a lot of talk therapy kind of starts from kind of top down where if you address what's happening in your mind, you can change what's happening in your body. I kind of take more of the notion of if you start showing up and uh, expressing your body and being with your body differently, that can change the way of what you're thinking and how you're being in your mind. So a lot of what you're going to hear from me today is more body oriented approaches because about like 80% of communication actually comes from our body up to our mind. And so if this is why a lot of the times, if we're constantly approaching some of the things that we're trying to change in our life, only from a mental place of, Mm -hmm. and like, I'm a big proponent of gratitude practices and changing the way we're talking to ourselves and all of those things, but we can't talk ourselves out of what is happening in our body. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's sometimes getting comfortable with being with what is showing up in my body. And that is why sometimes food behaviors come in. So things like, cause uh, you know, we had talked about, I work with a lot of individuals around emotional eating and binge eating. And that ultimately those patterns are also happening for a reason. Mm -hmm. If it didn't feel safe to express yourself growing up, if you were never taught that emotions were safe to feel, if the ways that people interacted with you, like if you, I'm a sensitive human being, if anybody else on here is a sensitive human being, yes, uh, you know, that if individuals told you growing up, stop being so sensitive, you know, suddenly this superpower that you have starts getting turned around as there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And that can feel so utterly painful when you are young and a child and don't really understand like that, you know, making that connection of, oh, this is just that someone else is uncomfortable and they don't know how to navigate my sensitivity, but that doesn't mean that my sensitivity is wrong or bad. You know, a young child doesn't know how to connect that together unless someone sits them down and explains that to them. And so food comes in to then support with navigating that pain because there's maybe not a lot, depending upon how many resources a child has at a young age, food is there for the most part, depends upon your history. You know, if food was also scarce, you know, when food did come in, that might've also, you know, affected your relationship with it of like, oh my gosh, I better take this in quickly right now because this is like finally get the food that I need. So a lot of different layers here. But food can be a way of self-soothing when it's like, I don't know, I don't understand why I'm feeling what I'm feeling and it feels uncomfortable and I don't know what to do with it. And also there is no parent, there is no guide, there is no person that is helping me walk through this right now. But there's food, there's food in the pantry, there's mom just made cookies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these ways that food can really be there as an ally. And that's why I like to normalize, like, again, you didn't do anything wrong or bad by choosing food to self-soothe. Maybe you didn't have any other tools in place, Mm -hmm. but food was there. And thank goodness food was there to support and protect you and feeling safe in an environment or in an experience that didn't produce that. So I think that there's, you know, a lot of layers when it comes to emotional eating and binge eating is that you know, it starts with befriending emotions, actually, which a lot of individuals come to me and they're like, I just got to get this food thing fixed. We just got to address this food thing. I just got to like, stop doing this emotional eating. And then everything else is going to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And usually I like to actually start with, okay, let's start to understand the rhythm of the emotional eating. What time does it happen in the day? What wisdom does it have to offer? And then they even get to kind of start befriending that behavior, that it's showing up for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that we get to start to see, oh, there are certain emotions or sensations that feel more difficult to sit with or process than others. And then that's actually the work is to start to say, okay, how can I give myself tiny little moments to sit with this emotion, this sensation that I'm actually really not used to sitting with. I'm not used to just allowing to be here because I've been so quick to reach for the food 
to help me out to process this. And it's a journey. I'm saying this in like the most simplistic way, and it is not simple at all. Having also had a past with emotional eating and binge eating as well, that there were times where the intensity of what was showing up in my body was so big that it was like, you know what? I do need to eat right now. Mm -hmm. That is actually my best tool is to say, you know what? I don't have the capacity to flow with this right now. I really do just need to go eat something. So it's really, it's a process. Yeah. And that's like a lot of self-acceptance that I'm hearing you say, like in those moments, instead of like really being harsh and judgmental when we do eat and we get that urge that you're kind of opening that compassion up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That it has to start from a place of, you know, even I like to explore with those that I work with that okay, let's say a binge eating or emotional eating experience happens, that it is never too late to check in with yourself. So a lot of the times there's this impulse to want to stop the behavior before it even starts. Sometimes that's just not possible, especially because that behavior is usually happening in a sympathetic nervous system response. And what I mean by that is it's happening in a fight or flight response. So already there is something that is being perceived as a threat in your environment. And so the food behaviors basically come in to support you in feeling safe. Now, why would you possibly need to slow down and assess, should I eat or not? If there is a tiger chasing you, it's just like automatically, we're just going to respond in any way we possibly can. We're also not in our prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. We're in our amygdala. We're in our fear response. and so. This is why I really like to bring in some of that, just normalizing what is actually happening inside of your body, because a lot of individuals, they judge themselves. Oh my gosh, I did it again. How could I possibly have done that again? I've been working so hard to change my behaviors, but you weren't online enough to be able to choose something different. Mm -hmm. So can we bring in a lot of compassion and acceptance in that moment that actually maybe you ate and then it felt safe enough to be back in your body that then you could assess, okay, what are my other choices now? So it's actually, sometimes it's, I'm going to check in after this is over and commit to the check-in after it's over. And then slowly you might back that up (laughs) or you might stop in the middle or you might stop midway through, or you might stop, oh, like the first couple of bites. And then you might start catching, oh, I have the urge to go eat right now. Am I actually physically hungry? No. Hmm. What might be coming up for me right now? But it actually takes time to get to that place of getting to know your bodily signs and signals of what a lack of safety and what a fight or flight response feels in your body. You can actually stay connected to your body while in a fight or flight response. But that takes practice and time to start to learn what are your cues. So I'm like the queen of disassociation. (laughs) I just learned that at a really young age. Oh, not safe to be here. Let's pop out of ourselves. And so over time, you get to learn what does it feel like to not be inside of my body? Oh, okay. And yeah, sometimes I'll even guide individuals of like, where are you? Are you like on a beach somewhere? Are you in your periphery? Where are you watching yourself? And people get actually really know. They're like, oh, I'm watching myself to the left. Or I'm like watching myself above myself when I'm dissociated. And once you start to even get to know that, It's like, oh, I'm not in my body right now. Oh, yep, there I am. I'm watching myself. I am not inside my body right now. And you then you start to learn to take a pause before reaching for the food because food ultimately isn't the answer in that moment. And it's saying, okay, I'm dissociated. I'm not inside of my body. I don't feel safe. What are small little ways that I could start to support me and feeling safe right now? So Stephanie, just to jump in here really quick is kind of like, um, so folks can kind of wrap their brains around this. Like you're really talking about those moments when we are into binge eating and emotional eating, when that animalistic urge is maybe coming on us, or we're just feeling like 
we just have this intense craving. So I really appreciate what you're sharing about the check-in, that it's going to take some practice, some trial and correction or whatnot. But just to, even if you do give into that, like it's okay to check in and just that it in itself is a, is a baby step to have a check-in after the fact. Um, but to tease out some other steps in that, what would that be? Like if you were to break that down. Yeah, I'm all about the baby steps as you know about <laughs> me. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Like this journey has to be baby steps. Like just think about like if you ate like a huge piece of food in your mouth, you'd have to chew and chew and chew to actually like break that food down enough to be able to digest that food. So we want to make sure that any changes you make on this journey are actually really small. And a lot of the times when maybe you've been struggling in your relationship with your food and body for a really long time, you're kind of sick of it. You're over it. It's really painful. You want it to be over with already. And so to hear like, I don't want to make small baby steps. I want to make huge steps. Right. I really get that. Like it can feel so frustrating. Sometimes a lack of patience can come up of just, I just want to be there already. I've already been on this journey for so long. And I would shift it potentially as a baby step of what could you enjoy along the way? So sometimes we're so focused on the end goal that you could enjoy the healing journey. Like Every day, if you even journaled something at the end of the day of like, what did I learn about myself today? I learned that actually anger is really uncomfortable for me to sit with. Mm -hmm. I actually learned that to take a deep belly breath inst instead of taking a shallow breath in my chest actually is really hard for me. Yeah. I learned that uh, chocolate cake is really actually very comforting in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it doesn't make me feel really great in my body long-term, mm. you know? So it's, it's kind of just coming down to naming what is and saying, that's kind of really cool to know about myself because I always like to normalize. You can always add the word yet afterwards. Mm. It's really hard for me to breathe into my body and that's just how it is now, but you know, I might learn it at some point mm -hmm. or, you know, it's really difficult for me to sit with that harsh internal critical voice and I might get there, you know, just saying like, yet, like, yeah, there's going to be more to this journey. This isn't the end of it. It's just where I'm at today. And that's really cool to get to know that about myself. Like we would give someone so much presence and space when we're like, you know, if you remember like a, a first date you had, it might've been a really long time ago, but like you maybe gave someone a lot of space to just be like, yeah, who are you? Hmm. Oh yeah. Like you lost your dog at a really young age and yeah, that affected you in that way. We would just like give them so much space to just be themselves and to say, Hey, I want to get to know who you are, the good, the bad, not necessarily that I label things as bad yeah, most right. of the time, but like, you know, just like all the parts. complexity. Like yeah, the all the parts. Of the, yeah, the complexity <laughs> of who you are as a human being. What if we did that for ourselves? Mm. Like, it, like, okay, yeah, this is just a part of me. Anger feels really uncomfortable for me to sit with. And why might that be? What if I got curious about that part of me that feels really uncomfortable sitting with this emotion or this sensation? So. In breaking it down into baby steps, I think it's first like starting to come into curiosity and deeper relationship with yourself to start to be like, okay, what is showing up? Can I just name it? Can I notice it? Can I start to even describe what it feels like in my body to be in a deeper relationship with it and show myself that it's even safe to feel this right now? And Again, that check-in can be before, during, or after choosing food to emotionally eat. Or um, let me say instead of, so emotional eating and binge eating is usually done out of a place of, I just don't want to feel the way I'm feeling right now. Got it. Yeah. There's, there's usually not a physical hunger that is happening in that moment. 
I often find that emotional eating or binge eating is happening when physical hunger is not present. Now, that's not to say that you could start eating a meal, being like, I am physically hungry right now. But then as you're eating, an emotional hunger comes up and the eating experience continues past fullness because now you've switched from physical hunger to emotional hunger. So sometimes they can happen at the same time. And it's, yeah, that's why the slowing down while you're actually eating is so important so that you can catch those subtle cues because they're really subtle sometimes. And we can only really catch that we feel full when we feel safe, connected, and in our body. So this is why a lot of individuals are like, I'm constantly overeating and I don't know why. And I first like to get curious about, okay, well, what are you doing while you're eating? Are you watching TV? Are you on your phone? Are like, what else are you doing? Because if we are not in our body, it is really hard to catch those subtle cues of fullness that, yeah, we might start noticing that we constantly feel just a little bit over full at every single meal. And then if you go into a place of, it feels difficult to sit with the discomfort of even just feeling like a little bit overly full, you might continue to keep eating that might go into an emotional eating or binge eating experience. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's got to start with slowing down and connecting with yourself and just even naming what is showing up. Sometimes I'd like to offer of like, say what's showing up in your body before, during, and after you eat. So before you eat, it's, I'm stressed out today. I have a lot on my plate. I just got some new news, whatever it might be. Okay, mid-meal, you put your fork down. How am I feeling now? This food is really good. I'm starting to feel satisfied. I'm still kind of stressed out. So I'm eating the stress while I'm eating the food. Like you gotta get curious about what emotions are also showing up in that experience because we are eating with that emotion as well. And then afterwards, okay, I feel satisfied. I'm noticing I still want to keep eating. I'm also noticing I'm full. I'm noticing that feels hard to stop eating. It's just like as if you were reading a book and they were describing to you an experience that a character was having. You know, to really taking away the story from it, like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. This is just your truth. This is what's showing up. And that actually, it takes away a lot of judgment and shame and guilt which those things perpetuate food behaviors. That if we judge ourselves for eating a piece of food, let's say, you know, a lot of us have an interesting relationship with something like chocolate, for example. So you eat a square of chocolate that was so yummy. You felt a lot of pleasure from it. And then you start judging yourself for eating chocolate. Okay, so now at this point, we're moving from a relaxation response to a fight or flight response in the body. We are, the body's starting to perceive that what you just did was bad or wrong or threatening. And so it actually perpetuates of now I feel uncomfortable. Now I feel unsafe. Maybe I'll eat more chocolate so that I can start to feel comforted by the judgment that just came up by eating the chocolate to begin with. So if we actually started saying, okay, I ate the chocolate that was really good. What's my relationship with receiving pleasure and allowing myself to receive the pleasure from eating that food? Because judgment actually takes us away from the experience we wanted to have with that food, which is why if you wanted to have pleasure of eating a piece of chocolate and then judge it, you have to keep eating the chocolate to get at the pleasurable experience you were looking for to have to begin with. But if you said, I'm allowed to eat this chocolate, I'm going to enjoy this piece of chocolate. I'm going to receive the pleasure from eating this chocolate. You kind of get to eat it and then just move on with your life. Like that was great. Like that was really pleasurable. That was exactly what I was looking for. And, and then just be done with it. So the practice here in a baby step is if the judgment comes up, it's like, put yourself in a different environment. You know, if you ate the piece of chocolate at your table, kitchen table, go put yourself into a different room in your house and say, okay, judgment, let's have a talk. You're really trying to protect me from something over why was it so bad that we ate that piece of chocolate? Like have a dialogue with that part of you, getting to know again, if they had a job to do, why are they trying to protect you from receiving that pleasure of eating chocolate? So they're showing up for a reason as well that, again, if we start to befriend all of our many parts and pieces of ourselves, 
then we just get to be a witness of our unfolding human experience. And you just get to make a decision moment by moment. I think a lot of the times we want this plan. I want a meal plan. I want to know how to show up with my food ahead of time. And really it's actually a moment by moment where, so our body doesn't know the difference between a real or perceived threat. Mm -hmm. And so we don't actually know what would potentially activate our system for a million of different reasons. Like, let's say your grandmother always wore a certain perfume and you're mm -hmm. out to lunch mm -hmm. and someone walks by you and like your grandmother has maybe is no longer physically here on this earth and someone walks by you and you're out at a restaurant and they're swearing that same perfume. All of a sudden you're like eating faster and you start to like overeat a little bit and you don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And it happens so quick that if we don't catch it, like, oh, wow, I just thought of my grandma. Oh, I miss her so much that if we don't catch that moment and just be with it, food comes in to be like, oh, we feel threatened. We don't yeah. know what's coming up or why. Let's keep eating so that we know that we're going to be okay. Yeah. Stephanie, these are such good thoughts and feelings that you're bringing to the surface. So what I'm hearing is that really slowing down and checking in with ourselves and having that curiosity is a big key to experiencing this healing in our relationship with food and body uh, and helping our brain, our bodies and our brains to come online so that we can access, like you were saying, that prefrontal cortex to make those empowered choices that you were talking about earlier for ourselves. And a lot of that means it helps us to loosen up the judgment, loosen up some of the pressure we put, like we got to be somewhere and uh, love the idea that, well, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. And just appreciating and respecting your own journey that um, there's no race to the finish line, as you said. So I know we had some questions come in and yes, I, yes. I would love to, we had two that were specific from some of the folks we coach that I would love to ask you while you're here with us today. One came in, how can I continue to eat the comfort food that I am unable to give up without feeling guilty? It's flour tortillas with cheese. And I know it's kind of awful, but it's my go-to snack. Is there any way to mitigate this habit so it's not so bad for me. Yeah. So first I would get curious about the internal dialogue that is showing up that says it's bad for you. And that sometimes we approach a meal or a specific food because of diet culture has told us that it's bad for us without actually slowing down and receiving that bodily feedback over, well, how does this actually digest in my body? Like not everyone is gluten and dairy sensitive as much as like diet culture they want us to believe. They've kind of like co-opted that. that. <laughs> You know, like I know plenty of people who can digest these food groups just fine. Mm -hmm. And so I would get really curious about first, like the next time you want to make this snack for yourself, really slow down and actually allow yourself to be in relationship with it. Mm -hmm. Notice the taste, the texture. What do you really actually enjoy about it? Sometimes we feel very attached to something because it's from a mental place of just, I've got to have this because maybe we have a memory around it. Like this is something I always made with this person in my family. And really it's not actually about the food. It's about the experience I had that I'm trying to replicate that. And so I would just get curious about how it feels in your body when you eat this food. So do you get a digestive upset? Does your tummy get bloated? Do you do your bowel movements get off? Um, does your sleep change in any particular way? You know, do you break out in acne? Like your body is going to give you some feedback if this food resonates with you or not. So I would kind of actually start there of 
if I had never eaten this food ever before, because already it sounds like there's a lot of stories that are coming in as soon as this person starts to eat this food, I shouldn't be eating this, I'm attached to this. And I would just say, "Mm, let's put all those stories aside for now. There's something about this food that actually feels very attractive or you feel pulled towards. And I want to start to learn why. Mm -hmm. And so even as you're eating it, like getting curious about any memories that come up, how is your body responding to you? And that check-in like before, how am I feeling? Even as I go into eating this, am I always choosing to eat this food? And you might start to notice a, a rhythm to, oh, wow, I always eat this when I feel lonely. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, I'm just throwing out an emotion, but like you're starting to get curious about, is there any even rhythm to there's a particular emotion that's always present when you go into eating that food, then pause in the middle. How is that food actually feeling? Drop into your body. Sometimes we eat so much from a mental place of, I'm so sad that this is going to be over soon, that we're not actually even eating the food. You're already at the end. Like, I'm so sad that I even started it and that I'm not going to be able to keep eating it. That <laughs> the pleasure you even wanted to have from eating this food that you love and you were allowed to love it, like, mm-hmm. allow yourself to love it. Like, really, really enjoy it because you may actually find that the pull towards it starts to become less. As you just say, this is not a bad food for me to have. I'm allowed to eat this whenever I want. And I've seen this with so many individuals that I have worked with that as soon as they allow themselves to eat the thing, I even had a client once that their kind of food that they had all these stories around that once we started working on just allowing themselves to have it, one day they just had one bite of it and they were like, yep, that was all I needed. And then they're just kind of like, we're like, yeah, I really don't. I don't even want another bite. I I just wanted that flavor, that texture, those, that taste in my mouth. And then they put it away or like, sometimes they would give it to someone else in their family and then they would finish it. And so I think even really allowing yourself to just eat it and notice and have those check-ins before, during, and after start to gain, gain more information around what is your relationship with this food now. I say this all from an emotional place. Now, from a physical place, let's say actually, yeah, it does cause a tummy upset. Um, Mm -hmm. Dairy doesn't always digest very well in me either. So if it's just, okay, yeah, I do actually, you know, my stomach gurgles and I do get kind of bloated and I do kind of have a weird bowel movement afterwards, but like, I feel like I don't want to give this food up. I would get really curious about that as well, that your body is telling you that this particular food doesn't resonate with you Mm -hmm. and that there is now an emotional attachment to it and what is kind of going on there. Because so I like to explore when we're saying no to something, we're saying yes to something else. When we're saying yes to something, we're saying no to something else. So when you say yes to that food, you're saying no to yourself. Mm-hmm. That's a different way to look at it. Yeah. So it's saying, okay, and look, we all eat foods that sometimes don't resonate with our system. And sometimes it's like so worth it. <laughs> you do it anyway. Yeah. Sometimes we have to normalize this. It's like, you know yeah. what? I'm going to like, I'm going to take a digestive enzyme. I'm going to like, you know, do take my things that help me digest this this burrito. It's totally worth it right now. Totally (laughs) worth it. Right. Like, let's just normalize that. That sometimes like we know something doesn't resonate with us and sometimes it's really just worth it. And so you kind of have to decide for yourself and get curious about, okay, I am having some physical symptoms from this. And that's why I say it's got to be a moment by moment decision where it's noticing the urge to reach for this particular food. I've now collected enough information over time that this food actually doesn't really resonate with me. Okay. So in this moment, do I want to navigate the sensations of bloating and discomfort and knowing I'm going to have maybe some really uncomfortable like bodily responses to eating this food and deciding for yourself, is that also something that you want to navigate? Because sometimes we're so quick to say, well, I just want this food. Can feel like a little bit from like an inner child place. I just want what I want, what I want. I just like want it now. And so, you know, there's me and wine. I do that. (laughs) Totally doesn't have good effects on me, but (laughs) yeah. 
And so even as you are sometimes choosing the food, if it's from kind of, you notice, like it feels very young, that a part of you is choosing it. It's like even being with that young inner child and saying like, okay, we're eating it right now. It doesn't resonate with our present day body, but we're doing this. And like, just continuing to notice, like, did that actually give you what you were looking for on some level? It maybe did on some level, maybe it didn't. And that's why it's just make the decision every single time on a particular day. You might actually say, I don't want to feel bloated today. I don't want to feel digestively uncomfortable. That is not going to be worth it. That is not how I want to feel in my body. And so I'm actually going to say no to this food. And that that's not I mean, from that empowered place, from what I'm hearing you say, not that judgmental place. There's a different feeling. Yeah. I like to call it the difference between dieting mentality and boundary mentality. Mm. So it, dieting mentality would be, there's a right or wrong here. And that you get to set boundaries with the parts and pieces of you. Sometimes it urges you on to go choose a certain food and say, I really hear that you want us to eat that food right now, but actually I don't think that that would be the best thing for my present day body. So I'm actually going to say no from a place of empowerment and deep listening. Not that I'm on a diet, not that I can't even ever eat that food ever again. You absolutely can, but it's more from, I am just wanting to stay in deep connection with my body today. And I'm really noticing that that wouldn't be the best decision for my body today. Stephanie, I really uh, love how you're bringing out how all these challenges with food and body and even our weight can be a doorway to our, to our growth and to our healing and transformation. So um, just using these things that are coming up in our life, even on those micro levels, like the, the tortilla or the wine or the chocolate, whatever it is, whatever it is for you, like just getting that curiosity and being open to what is this teaching me and how can I learn about myself through this? Um, one more question and then I'm going to see if anyone here has something they would like to ask you. But this one is, I've wondered about hormones for women and how and if a vegan or vegetarian diet affects that hormonal balance and in turn emotional stability. This is important to me because my daughter is vegan and was vegetarian for years and she is sensitive and emotional. That's a big Ooh, question. That is a big one. <laughs> a lot of different layers to it. So I first want to name that in my experience, I have not seen, I really truly believe that a vegan or vegetarian way of eating is a healing modality and not something that is often sustainable long-term. And I say that with the caveat that many individuals, it does resonate with their body. So I, you never know how long that kind of way of eating will resonate with your body. Mm -hmm. At some point, just in my work, I have seen that most of the vegans or vegetarians that I have worked with, and it might be years, it might be decades, they start craving a piece of fish usually yeah. starts with a piece of fish for some reason. Uh, I'm sure there is a reason. I haven't looked into it too much, but, or they like will pass by a piece of meat and smell it. And suddenly their body is just like that. I want that. And what I have found is that a lot of individuals sense of identity can get caught up with being a vegan yeah. instead of like, I am eating in this particular way because it resonates with me. It gets wrapped up in identity and then suddenly it's, well, if I eat a piece of meat, I won't be myself anymore. Or what would my friends and family think because I've been identified by eating in this particular way? So I think that there, for a lot of individuals, that when they get to that moment where it doesn't resonate with them anymore, there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. of getting off of it. And that it's just like, I'm just doing something wrong. And sure, absolutely. At that point in time, because I know a ton of individuals who do it for moral reasons, like they can just, they simply cannot imagine eating a piece of animal protein. It just like goes antithesis to their morals, their values as a human being. And absolutely there are supplementations. I think you need to actually be working with a doctor more closely if you want to eat this particular way and getting your blood checked more often. Because things like iron, things like B-complex, things like B12, 
you just need to be more conscientious of making sure that your body is getting what it needs without eating animal protein. Yeah. So I, I want to just start there of like, I really, really, really want to honor everyone's path. And that if someone is feeling drawn to eating in that particular way, and it's resonating with them right now, I'm all about that body trust. I want someone to trust their body and what they feel like is going to be best for them. And that is the most important thing here that no one else lives in your body. Mm -hmm. Only you live in your body. Only you get to know how your body talks to you. Only you will begin to understand its feedback and its symptoms and the way that it communicates things with you. Mm -hmm. And so if someone else is fearful over, oh my gosh, they're not eating animal protein. Are they going to be okay? I think that is an opportunity to just take a mirror back to self of what is coming up for you because that person is doing the best that they can to listen to their body and what they feel like is best for them. Mm -hmm. And so unless it comes to a situation where they're not eating enough, we're now going into a little bit of like eating disorder land and that some individuals will sometimes utilize vegan or vegetarianism as a way to stay in their eating disorder to stay away from foods that maybe feel scary to eat, unless we are at that place where someone's literal life is in danger. Mm -hmm. We really have to put a lot of trust in other people's journeys that they're listening to what resonates with them and what foods they feel like are gonna work for their body. And then if you feel fearful, it's like, why am I so scared of them not eating animal protein? You know, it, like, and sometimes it can be, well, am I supposed to do that? Like, like, am I supposed to eat that way? Like all these stories come, start coming back to self where it's just sometimes if we don't take that pause to check in with ourselves and are like, why am I reacting this way? We can kind of put our fears and our worries and concerns on someone else mm -hmm. where that's not their responsibility. And there are some individuals where going back to the question, they actually find that it stabilizes their hormones, not eating animal protein. And that for other individuals, it destabilizes them. This is why we're all so unique. Yes. Yeah. And so it comes back to bioindividuality of really discovering what's going to work for you. And that, you know, if you are a female with a cycle, that it's tracking your cycle a little bit more. And, you know, how do you feel right before your cycle comes? Is your cycle regular? Are you ovulating? You know, do you have a certain rhythm that you can rely on from week to week? So it's really getting to know that for yourself. But also, yeah, if your hormones are all over the place, I would say working with a naturopath or functional medicine doctor is really important because there actually could be a lot going on there that has nothing to do with the diet. You know, it could be that you have a gut dysbiosis, an imbalance of gut bacteria, and that like any food that you're eating is not digesting very smoothly. And then that's throwing your hormones off. And so it's just like, if we, again, like exactly how I started, if we solely just focus on the food all the time, we are maybe missing so many other pieces, like even just the am I looking at my stress levels? Mm -hmm. You know, you could be eating the like most perfect diet on the planet, which doesn't exist, but if there was one and you were eating it to a T and it's so, and you're just like, and I'm not still not feeling well. It's like, if you are living with high stress levels every single day, that is throwing everything off in your body, shutting down your digestion where you're not really digesting anything coming in. So this is why sometimes we have to take the pressure off of the what we're eating and get really curious about also what else might be going on that is affecting our well being. Stephanie, you did such a great job, like teasing out so many important pieces of that question. That was a big question. And really, like, even, even in that, like bringing it back to self, like, what am, what can being curious, like, what is being triggered in me? And what is that about? That gentle, compassionate curiosity. Uh, that even in those situations, um, honoring her journey, honoring your journey, this has been amazing. I know we are at time and I wish we had you for another hour, <laughs> but I, I wish to come back anytime. And 
if anyone, if I didn't get to your question, I know we hopped to like a lot of different places and there were so many things that we wanted to cover today uh, that email me, uh, support at stephaniemara.com, S-U-P-P-O-R-T at stephaniemara, that's M-A-R-A.com. And you can email me personally anytime. I always answer my own emails and it's very important to me. Yeah, thank you for putting that in the chat. And so, yeah, just like if you have any questions that you would love further support on, I also offer free 20 minute connect calls. So if you also go to my website, which is stephaniemara.com. So same thing as my email address. And uh, basically if you go to contact me, you can book a free 20 minute connect call and we can chat for 20 minutes about whatever maybe we didn't touch on today. And I have to say that I have had one-on-ones with Stephanie and amazing the way she holds space for, for your story, for your journey. And I always left feeling like I was really held Stephanie. Like you just have this way of bringing a warm hug. Um, and just every time I think of you, I have that feeling in my heart. Uh, she had a great, you did so good with helping me to recognize how I can bless my own journey. So that was one of the biggest things that I've taken away from you being my mentor. And I, I know that Stacy and I are passionate about carrying on the torch with all everyone in this community. I, and I would love just really quickly, any final or closing thoughts that you would like to share with our community today? Yeah, I think a big theme here today has really been Anything that you're navigating in your relationship with your, your food and your body, start with curiosity. Begin to picture it with fresh eyes of that you're not doing anything wrong or bad, that even if it feels intense, even if it feels like a pattern that you want it to be over, that any reaction, any pattern that is even playing out, again, it's happening for a reason and it's giving you information of the state of your body. And that I love that you even brought in of when you bring a mirror to yourself, do it with compassion because mm -hmm. even your responses to others or yourself has been you doing the best you possibly can. Judgment is not needed here. And so even if it was, oh, wow, I was putting my fears on someone else, meet yourself with compassion. That was my best because I wasn't aware of it before, but now I am. And so it also starts with awareness. Like we cannot change what we're not aware of. And so if we start with curiosity and awareness, you just get to grow and evolve from there and give yourself plenty of plenty of time mm -hmm. and, you know, find ways to enjoy the journey. You know, even if it's like, that was a really cool thing to learn about myself today, or yeah, I did practice showing up with my relationship with food in a new way today. And it wasn't easy and it maybe didn't go super smooth, but I did it. Like, can it be just a big deal that you did it and you tried? And so really also acknowledging yourself every step of the way is an important part of this process so that the journey feels sustainable. So that it's like, can I acknowledge myself even for the tiniest baby step that I did today? Like, even if you're trying to like physically move your body more and it's like, I put my sneakers on today. I didn't go anywhere, <laughs> it didn't happen, but I put my sneakers on today. That's a pretty big deal. Because then the next day you put your sneakers on, you might walk out the front door and then you might turn around and walk back in, but it will grow from there. So really allow yourself to be in the process. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This has just been so valuable. So many nuggets of wisdom that we can bring out of today's conversation. Thank you again for your time and everyone who was able to join us. We're so glad that you were able to be here today and you take care. Be sure to reach out to Stephanie with any questions and of course to Stacy and I. So, all right, have a great day. Bye-bye.